Hello and welcome to another episode of Homebrewed Christianity. Uh, Trip Fuller and I are about to hit the road to do an event which we were going to call For Christ's Sake, <laughs> but then thought that was maybe a little bit too much. Too much? Too much. The subtitle would be Liar, Lunatic and Lord, which or, I quite like. No and. Or just freaking awesome. Or, no, this is not a book promotion trip. No. This is not promoting your book. This is promoting an amazing event where we will talk theology, the meaning of Christianity, and whether pyro or process is closer to the message of Christ. And, and, and under what situation would they do that other than by sampling large amounts of local craft beverages in, in a taco truck? That sounds perfect to me. And, um, I might have to go. The real question, Pete, is, is whether or not after Theology Beer Camp, I'm going to see your Instagram story of a desk with large numbers of cigars that happened to be in the humidor that we were on stage during beer camp. You know, I, I don't know what happened. I feel very bad. Uh, someday I will confess to how many cigars I actually sold <laughs> on eBay that I stole from you and then later made money off. <laughs> well, um, if you want to uh, nerd out with us this summer in August in Denver, Oklahoma City, then go to theologybeercamp.com and uh, get ready. Get ready for just a, a a giant collection of imagination juice. Wow, that is beautiful. We'll see you there. What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and guess what? Today on the podcast, you're going to get to hear from the one and only Ronald Stone. That is right, theology. I know what you're saying. Is this the Ronald Stone who was? Reinhold Niebuhr's last student taught with him, edited and published lots of his writings and, 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 and preached a sermon at his funeral. Yes, it happens to be that. Does what a this, coincidence. Does this, does this interview, Nathan, include really sweet stories about Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Tillich at the end? It does. So you got to listen all the way to the end to get mm. all those goodies, and, and here, those nuggets. And here's the thing. Uh, the first book I bought that's a secondary theological resource was Stone's book on the radical social thought of Paul Tillich. I was in my second year of undergrad, was in a class called uh, Contemporary Theology, and I picked Paul Tillich to write my paper on. Like you do. And I wanted to write on Paul Tillich's uh, political philosophy, and I just read The Socialist Decision, an early Paul Tillich book. Uh, You want to guess the topic? Go for it. You can look it up. (laughs) And... I went to a used bookstore, Stevens Bookstore in Raleigh, North Carolina. Good old epic Steve. Used, epic used bookstore. And there was Ronald Stone's book, Paul Tillich's Radical Social Thought. I bought it. I read it. And I've, ever since then, I, I've, I've, when, I, when I got his memoir in the mail, mm-hmm. Between Two Rivers, the book right. that jettisoned this conversation, I was like, are you the same guy that wrote that book that's on my <laughs> shelf? And I, I look it up. Boom. It, it is. is. Amazing. Yeah. And so it, this was awesome. When, oh, like 20-year-old trip or 19-year-old trip Ooh, read him for the first wow. time. And here he was answering my questions. Amazing. I know. That's the magic of podcasting. It is the magic of podcasting. And uh, I just thought right now we should dedicate this episode to all the members of the Howard and Mafia. <laughs> um, Ronald Stone and I happen to be... Uh, Fans of Niebuhr. Uh, now, I'm not going to try to keep up with him. I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I'm not going. But um, I, I enjoyed his, uh, in the uh, Niebuhr documentary we watched recently, mm-hmm. His he was in there too. His uh, his witty comments were Oh, yeah. Enjoyable. The, the Niebuhr documentary is great, by the way. If you haven't seen it, you should. Um, but, uh, yeah, this this is an episode dedicated to the Howard Wassian Mafia. Um, uh, a listening to one uh, very influential uh, public policy shaping uh, politically engaged activist ethical theologian uh, who, who was inspired and taught by uh, the 20th century's greatest one uh, about like what Christian ethicists are supposed to do it's a really good conversation and yeah. it's you know it's it's timely and important and you know all those good things too plus plus I Entertaining. If, if you're a member of the mafia, which is an, uh, a non-violent mafia. How Ross is this? Go figure. Um, and and you, really, I'm just giving Jason Michelli a hard time. That's what it is from crackers and grape juice. I don't want all the How Rossi and Mafia mad at me. Just him. Just him. But no, I can think of a few others, but I don't want to name names. <laughs> but not all of them. It's not personal. This is a sarcastic, over-the-top jab at him. Uh, do you know that Jason? This is crackers and grape juice. Jason, mm-hmm. Seneca's his blog. Mm-hmm. That the. the 
the guy that made the Niebuhr uh, film mm-hmm. goes to his church. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So apparently his his sermons do not convince. <laughs> That's a sick burn. It doesn't. It, it didn't even work on after that documentary. That um, but yeah. So, so I, are, I are we? we gonna is there going to be like a, in the intro? Yeah, is there going to be like an intro battle now between crackers no, and grape juice? No, and, no. I know. I, you're supposed to shoot up, not shoot down. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, yeah. So other things to mention in this intro is theology beer camp. You should come. We're doing it in Denver. And then we're doing it in Oklahoma City this August. Me and Peter Rollins are going, and um, it's going to be amazing. On top of that, we're going to do it on the East Coast this fall. Oh, this the, is the first time. The last weekend we're of October. Announcing it. We're not telling anyone where it's going to be. No, but this this is the first time that oh. we're announcing that we're not announcing it yet. Oh, yeah. So in the near future, we will have an announcement. And it will be related to the East Coast. This is not flyover country. No, like the summer's flyover country. Yes. Even though Denver protests. Um, and, I, and, and Oklahoma City said, yes, we are. Yes, we don't are. come they, here. They embrace it. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, don't come here unless you're a talented basketball player joining uh, Russell Westbrook and friends at the Thunder. But they don't want you to come. Oklahoma City, they're like, don't move here. You can visit for beer <laughs> camp and move along, move along, move along. Um, so you should definitely visit for beer camp. Oh, you should. But the they don't want you to come there. Theology, but uh, Denver says that they're they're coastal, but on a mountain. I think that's. I don't know how that works, but they they have the coastal vibe. I think it's just because they legalize weed there. That's that's all it is. Yeah, that's really. All and so is. they're like, we're basically like San Francisco, and you're like, you're not. Mountain elite is that a thing? Mountain elite. Yeah, we'll go with that. Mile high elitist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, how could you hook the word elite and elevation? Together. Um, Elitivation. Elitivation. That's the mile high people. Anyway, uh, Theology Beer Camp uh, is happening this August, and then in the near future, we refuse to acknowledge that we might indeed announce a said beer camp for the East Coast, but it cannot be confirmed, and it's not going to be denied. That'd obviously. be ridiculous. Yeah. And I can guarantee you that it would not be strategically timed for the last weekend of October, which is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It would be the perfect time to do it. It would be the perfect. Time. It would be, um, if we're if we're going to do it then, yeah. uh, which I don't know. Who knows? Perhaps. See, that was Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Jack says perhaps. Ooh, that's not that far from him. Where if we were going to do it on the East Coast, if we were going to do it on the East oh, Coast, yeah, I'm going to have to call somebody. We might have to make some phone calls. Yes. So stay we tuned leave. for that. <laughs> so this is a podcast. <laughs> And at Homebrew Christianity, we like to bring you audiological ingredients so you can brew your own faith. And this is gonna ba- this is gonna happen. You're gonna like it. This if, is a great episode. If you're a real theology nerd. And I thought right as we go into this, I should just answer a question I got asked on Twitter. The, Nathan, you, you I'm gonna see if you even you even uh watch Twitter the whole time that you were you were gone, like helping your family and stuff. But someone said, Um, you realize that you have introductions that someone expects it to be jovial and playful the whole time and then all of a sudden there's an hour of very intense theology that's hard to follow like it could be (laughs) off-putting and I said not for those with ears to hear that's right yeah theology nerds they know what's up they're like ah that's fun they're having fun in the intro and then all of a sudden they're like that was an hour on Reinhold Niebuhr and Christian ethics and stuff. That was intense. And you say you say yes to both. It's like when you go to work out, you know, you got to warm up first. Mm-hmm. You can't just jump right in. You'll no. hurt yourself. You know what I mean? No. The intros, we're warming you up, you yeah. know, getting your blood flowing, getting yeah. you ready. I, I know. And I found the hip word for this is called narrow casting. Narrow Some people casting. broadcast. Ah. They, they want to say something for everybody. And now, no. Podcast? No, 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 no. We don't. We don't want to know podcast for everybody. No, no. We're narrow casting to nerds that also are comfortable having slightly inappropriate humor related to very serious topics and enjoy taunting Howard Wasians in the intro. If that's you, well, I'm having welcome. to really clear my throat from having a special Howard Wasian Mafia guest episode not that long ago. Yeah, but uh, you know, life is full of guns and wars. 
God. And everyone's been trampled on the floor, and I hope you're all ready because this is Ronald Stone. And I grew up in a, a Methodist church in a small town in Iowa, but the Methodist church itself was a large church, and it was uh, very thorough in its programming presentations and also in its uh, commitment to uh, liberal evangelical uh, Methodism. And uh, by the time of high school, I was deeply involved. I went through something of a conversion experience at about 16 years of age. And then uh, before I graduated from high school, I went off to a uh, Methodist work camp at the Navajo Reservation in uh, New Mexico and spent part of the summer there. And so my first public speech really was on uh, Native American rights, uh, with particular reference to the Navajo that came out of that uh, experience. Mm -hmm. And the Methodist Church kept nurturing me, uh, helping me to get an education. I attended a small Methodist college in Sioux City, Iowa, uh, which had three great professors, a historian, a philosopher, and a professor of religion. They all had good deal of influence on me. I ran a camp uh, for Goodwill Industries. It had a Wall Street mission down by the stockyards. And I ran that in my last summer. I was preaching in a small Methodist church by the banks of the Missouri River, but I ran the camp and I had a Winnebago children there and also the children of the poor of Sioux City, both African-American and Anglo or white. So by the time I left college, I'd had uh, all these experiences in the Methodist Church, including a citizenship trip to uh, <clears throat> New York City mm -hmm. and at the United Nations. And it just happened that while we were having a worship service at Union Seminary, they asked me to read scripture or something I'd forgotten. So I robed in the faculty room of uh, Union Seminary, borrowing somebody's gown. I don't know who. And then later in that same trip in D.C., I got into a debate with Hubert Humphrey over uh, providing free education to those of us who had a hard time meeting tuition costs mm. in American higher education. At that time, Hubert couldn't think that far ahead. I'm sure if he were still alive now, he'd be on the side of uh, free tuition. But uh, in that day, he, his imagination didn't go quite that far mm -hmm. again. But then I moved off to uh, Union Seminary in New York. And um, it was a little stretch for me academically the first semester, as I was coming from a small college in the Midwest. And a lot of these guys were from Ivy League colleges and major universities on the East Coast, but it took me a semester to catch up. Mm -hmm. then, then I came under the influence of uh, three great teachers. Uh, they were all Christian realists. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, John Bennett, and Roger Shin. And as life would have it, I ended up preaching memorial services for Niebuhr and Bennett as they passed away. The one who had the most influence on me, of course, was Reinhold Niebuhr. Mm -hmm. I attended his lectures at Barnard College, which was across the street from Union. And in 1963, and he was lecturing on democracy and where it came from and <clears throat> the prospects for its future in the uh, rest of the world. And they were exciting lectures. I looked him up a couple of times in his office. And then, I, of course, I went back to my studies and started the Ph.D. at Columbia, mm -hmm. had a hard time deciding between government or religion. And at the last minute, I switched my application to religious studies, thinking I could better do interdisciplinary studies in uh, religious studies than I could in government. I think that's proven true. My son is a major uh, political scientist, and though he's quite Christian, there's not much of a way to bring his faith into uh, his academic, more secular studies. But for me, I've always been able to uh, wear two hats, but then mm -hmm. to integrate them in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. So I served as secretary for the United Church of Christ, or 
secretary to the director of international affairs of the United Church of Christ. And I ran seminars at the United Nations and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, then I went off to Oxford to study political philosophy. And we didn't really have enough money to stay a second year, but we might have worked it out. But uh, Roger Shin phoned and asked if I'd like to be his assistant teaching Christian ethics at Union. And then two weeks later, he wrote and said Reinhold Niebuhr was going to need an assistant. So uh, at that point, I dropped (laughs) the pursuit of the Oxford degree and went back to New York. So happily, then I co-taught with Roger Shin and John Bennett and Reinhold Niebuhr, though Niebuhr was, as a senior figure, was the most important to me. So ever since then, I've lived my life uh, sort of relating religion to social problems and uh, very active in the local church and later in the Presbyterian Church at the national level. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I've become something of a churchman, I guess I would say, as a lot of my social ethics work and social action has been supported by the church, and I've lived through that. Mm-hmm. I did go back to write a book on John Wesley, and so that took me back to Oxford for several trips, and that was great. I love Wesley. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've written a book on his social ethics, and I regard him as the one 18th century white man, dead white man now, that had a right on the slavery issue and on issues for African Americans. He was really very prophetic and ahead of his time here. Now, there were others, too, but uh, he stands out, along with Wilberforce, as the great evangelical leader to stop the... uh, slave trade. Mm -hmm. I also found him very good on poverty, very good on issues of war and peace, and just a brilliant, well-informed academic who uh, merged his academics with his evangelical Christianity to have incredible influence on England. So the difference between my own teachers and Wesley would be that none of them would accept... uh, perfection as a yeah. human capacity. They would all regard it, go with Paul, that unfortunately we continue to sin <laughs> in our lives, even though we're converted, transformed, changed. The old Adam uh, continues and is strong in us, and that needs to be one of the presuppositions of political, social action. Mm-hmm. So occasionally I and preach in a Methodist church. I guess my, though I became a Presbyterian, I guess my greater influence in the Methodist church would be in the state of Iowa. I have a minister brother there who's a Methodist minister, and he's brought me out to help lead the Methodist Federation of Social Action and to teach on peacemaking and urban ethics and things like that to um, Methodist ministers. So I have a certain amount of following out there in Iowa, and I, uh, I love them, and I certainly respect the work that particularly the Methodist Social Federation does in, does in Iowa. So for me, they go together. Uh, Wesley was right. That predestination wasn't a very good idea, <laughs> as the Calvinist thought. And the whole Calvinist tradition is probably stronger in uh, respecting the ongoing sin that the uh, saints have to keep uh, wrestling with. Mm-hmm. Do, so, so let me pause at that point, uh, Trip, and see where you want to take it. Well, um, uh, so I was first introduced to you in undergrad. I was decided I was writing my first theology paper on Paul Tillich, and oh, really? Uh, <laughs> and I went and I went to a used bookstore to buy Paul Tillich books, and they had Paul Tillich's Radical Social Thought. And I was wanting to write a book on uh, Tillich and his uh, kind of early political philosophy, uh, the socialist decision and that kind of thing. So um, that was my first encounter with you, which then led to reading you know, books on Niebuhr and like the relationship of Niebuhr and Tillich at Union that you wrote later and stuff like that. And and I wonder if, if – uh, if you could just 
introduce what it means to be a Christian realist because there's so many facets to the individual characters uh, that you talk about in your um, autobiography, but also uh, have written books on their thought that I think today in seminaries and in the church, there's an ambiguity around our kind of engagement politically and socially that uh, has dismissed Christian realism for a number of reasons, uh, and it gets caricatured often. And so if if you were to describe what it means to be a Christian realist, um, how would you – what kind of features would you uh, highlight, draw out, emphasize? Okay, thank you. I guess I didn't get around to saying anything about Tillich in my introductory remarks. Now that was sort of a development uh, so that I wasn't so easily typed as uh, simply a Niborian because mm-hmm. Tillich had informed structure of my theology. And then I wrote quite a bit about his uh, thinking about uh, society. Well, I understand the realist tradition, of course, to be broader than Christianity. It includes people like Aristotle and uh, maybe Hobbes and maybe even, uh, I won't say Machiavelli because he's really real politique. Uh, but it includes people in the Christian tradition from Paul, Augustine, uh, Calvin, Luther, uh, the Calvinist part of John Wesley. You know, his parents are both Calvinists, mm-hmm. and, and uh, he was close friends with a lot of Calvinists, and a lot of his thought is not only Episcopalian, it's the Presbyterian or Calvinist part of the Episcopal or Anglican Church that that was so important to him. But uh, so it's got these deep roots, in what I call the classical Christian tradition. At uh, Union, uh, people you needed to know, of course, were Paul and Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, uh, Calvin, and Luther, and then you kind of sorted it out from there when you went beyond the Reformation. So Christian realism uh, is theologically a neo-Reformation School. It takes the Reformation very seriously, drawing on these other deeper, older theological traditions. And it always recognizes that the struggle for justice is a battle, that the world resists justice, that most people, when they operate socially and politically, operate out of greed, and uh, too often they operate out of pride. You know, Augustine, City of God, Mm -hmm. argues that uh, all of history is driven by our love, (laughs) our eros, you know, towards what we want. Mm -hmm. And too often we want that just for ourselves or for our group. That's the fundamental insight of the realism, that politics is a struggle for one's own group privilege, power privilege, and this always has to be taken into account. Now, the realist I'm interested in, which would reach back and include Aristotle, as well as uh, uh, James Madison and John Witherspoon in this country. The American Constitution is very much a realist document. You know, Madison was taught by John Witherspoon, the Calvinist from Scotland. Mm-hmm. And uh, Witherspoon insisted Madison not graduate. They had to stay around and spend another year at Princeton to learn uh, his Hebrew. And so there's the Constitution of the United States is a very realist document where the Declaration of Independence might be a little more enlightenment. There's partially the difference between their major authors uh, and uh, the way they've worked out in their history. Mm -hmm. You're right. The realism was severely criticized uh, at Union and even later in Christianity and Crisis in the... uh, particularly in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, drifting into the 90s. And so one of the goals of my life has been to defend Christian realism as the most Christian and the most appropriate way to work in society. But uh, it's had a revival, of course. Mm -hmm. And now there's, as you know, a new movie out. There are many new books. There's a Niebuhr Society. And great influence in uh, history departments, 
political science departments. Um, some political scientists have written, and there are still more dissertations written on Niebuhr in political science than on any other major thinker. No, Niebuhr was critical of the church, though he loved the church. But I think his influence out there in the secular world uh, has probably been stronger than his uh, than the love for him in the uh, in the church. After all, he was pretty radical for the church, and he was very critical of it for not getting aboard the civil rights movement, mm-hmm. not dealing more strongly with the nuclear weapons uh, and other issues that too often the church was timid, sentimental. And uh, though I love the church and work for the church, I've often felt that to be the case. I would say the Presbyterian church social policy has been Christian realist from, uh, oh, let's say, the 70s mm-hmm. up to up to the uh, present. There's a little revival of social gospel optimism now, but that's mostly... Uh, a minor movement, and most of the analysis of the Presbyterian Church still hinges its analysis on the dialogues between God and sin, you know? Those are the the great uh, sort of realist fulcrums when you're trying to deal with history and politics. God is transcendent, but it's all finally dependent on God. God remains a judge and redeemer, so there are possibilities uh, for human life to expand and grow. But unfortunately, in the growth, uh, sin tails along <laughs> yeah. and keeps turning keeps turning good things into uh, much less than good. You know, we have a hard time in democracy in terms of dealing with uh, race relations. Mm-hmm. We have a hard time in democracy in dealing with economic justice, and we've tended now to become a warrior uh, nation. So though the realist commitments are to democracy in a much more clear way, say, than liberation theology, mm-hmm. and they're committed to politics in a much more clear way than the social gospel or, lib- or uh, liberation theology, would be, uh, but uh, yet they recognize that religion is not politics. Um, you know, God's not to be used for someone's selfish political gains, mm-hmm. and that uh, the judgment of God needs to be felt, particularly on these major issues of social justice, race relations, uh, human relations, uh, war and peace, and those sorts of issues. Uh, in the in the book, you you talk about one time that you were teaching a class where you're reading Niebuhr and also reading um, Yoder, and I know that the, like the politics of Jesus, the kind of uh, strong correlation between what Jesus says directly to your ethics as a Christian, to the expectations of the church, and that has remained, I think, attractive to a lot of people, um, and I know. Uh, when I was in seminary, a lot of people rediscover this type of um, you know, Anabaptist style ethics, and their immediate uh, you know friction point is like Niebuhr and anyone that's a realist. They just they don't trust the power of the resurrection, or they would you know follow through and and this type of thing. I I wonder that like as opposed to setting up just you know jabbing back and forth at each other when you were reading like texts that conflict that much where you saw the the fruitful conversation and the the hinge points for uh, thinking through the kind of bigger ethical issues well i've uh, taught uh, john yoder's the politics of jesus i didn't use it much in seminary but in summer schools, I'd go out to Pacific Lutheran University, mm-hmm. and I often often used it there, and I would often balance it with uh, Moral Man and Immoral Society of Reinhold Niebuhr. And John and I did have a debate 
at Pittsburgh Seminary, uh, just one. Uh, sometimes we, at least once, we roomed together at Society of Christian Ethics. So we 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 knew uh, each other and where we were coming from uh, very clearly. And uh, I agree, the Anabaptist uh, theology is important, and the conversations are rich. In fact, here in Pennsylvania, when the Mennonites and the Presbyterians were having dialogues, they would usually ask me to come to their conferences, you know. And so I've been in a lot of Mennonite uh, realist uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. um, the um, I think often the books, whether they make Jesus a contemporary pacifist or a contemporary revolutionary, are taking things from the New Testament writers, and the New Testament writers are not Jesus. Mm -hmm. They're people responding to the crisis and the witness of Jesus as they've been given the tradition that I think too many contemporary writers take metaphors and references to the word legion or to something that sounds military or Maybe there was a zealot on the other side in his band of disciples or something. And I think they blow these out of proportion. Now, Niebuhr uh, taught, you know, that he thought Jesus was relatively apolitical. Mm -hmm. And uh, wouldn't have, he wouldn't have put him with a revolutionary nor with a pacifist. And I find so much of what's done with contemporary uh, readings of Jesus is they, there's so much reading of the authors in to these very limited sources on the social questions. I mean, so many will tend to make um, Niebuhr, I mean, Jesus, uh, revolutionary against the Romans. But there are way too many texts uh, in which uh, Jesus is associating with Romans and understanding them and not not condemning them. Uh, that I think to make Jesus a contemporary pacifist overdoes the argument. I was never, you know, Yoder depends so much on this one French New Testament critic, mm -hmm. and I was never persuaded by that uh, source, just like I have not been persuaded by the many books now which make Jesus out to be a, a revolutionary who was trying to take over uh, Jerusalem. Though even Rudolf Bultmann thought that years ago. I think the Schweitzer arguments that it's very hard to get back to Jesus, his particular teachings are stranger than we know, and that we meet him best when we're engaged in action for the kingdom of God or for love or for justice. And then we encounter Jesus in those particular struggles. So exegetically, I don't accept the, the that Jesus was anything like a contemporary pacifist. Yeah. And nor do I nor do I accept that he was anything like a contemporary revolutionist. Though there are many good books that argue that. Uh, I'm a little more influenced by Schweitzer, and uh, I think Niebuhr overdid the apolitical, because I think uh, Niebuhr had really read Jesus through perfectionist eyes, and I think Jesus probably was a little more involved in the politics and the stuff of history than Niebuhr ever conceded he was. But in my reading, I can't make out enough to say what the program of uh, political social program of Jesus was. Mm -hmm. um, he obviously is hard on the Jewish leadership. You know, there's so many texts against the Pharisees and the Sadducees that I think that has to be taken seriously. But there aren't that those kind of texts against the Romans. Uh -huh. uh, certainly, if you can read one or two that way, like when they talk about the legion of demons yeah. in, the, in the pigs that run into the lake. Now, is that to be a Roman legion? Uh, I think that's stretching it, you know. I think you're just picking up the uh, language of the time and... Um, and using it. So I like to make our decisions on war and peace, 
uh, much more pragmatically, and I use the criteria of just war theory in a very pragmatic, non-dogmatic way. Mm -hmm. uh, I sort of help lead the Presbyterian Church into the position that there are times that the human situation deteriorates so badly that the only way to save a population from genocide is to intervene and to use soft diplomacy, but to also to be ready to use uh, whatever military force is necessary to save endangered populations. I recognize how difficult that is, but I think anything less is uh, irresponsible. Uh, let me put it this way, too, that love, which is our central commandment, and it's just to me, absolutely clear that the Christian ethic is one of love, and practically that seeks justice for the neighbor. That love drives in the direction of uh, nonviolence, but it also drives in the direction of responsibility. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I've been in dozens of <laughs> nonviolent demonstrations, but I've also, when I was safety director from my ghetto neighborhood near here, I hired more police to do the work that needed to be done. Whether John Yoder would have ever hired more police or not, I don't know. I know in one Mennonite town I knew of, my high school friend was hired to be the cop because he could carry a weapon. Uh, he was a Methodist. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do find, because I live in a city, I've lived all my adult life in the city and always near, if not either in integrated neighborhoods or across the street from minorities. Well, uh, one the of the, cities are, the, city, the cities are tough and they need protection, you know. One of the things that like this conversation brings up in a lot of the, uh, especially in more progressive Christians, is you know, Niebuhr was rather direct that part of your duty as a Christian in a uh, liberal democracy is to participate and work to bring about justice to protect the weak uh, in this type of thing. And I think there's a lot of progressive Christians who their language sounds like they're Anabaptist or the theology they'll bring up will be liberation theology. But in a weird way, they still act and work out of a, a, Christ, a type of Christian realism they don't acknowledge. And I wonder if there's something to be gained if um, it, if we as Christians in uh, a Western democracy uh, avoid or, or something's missed if we avoid developing theological ethics, recognizing uh, the the power, place, and situation that we're in. Well, exactly. Um, I arranged for my local church to hire uh, security people because my students couldn't, on one occasion, my students who are coming down to this inner city church to tutor the poor so they can get somewhere in school uh, couldn't make it because there were too many gunshots going on around there. So we hired security force for the church and then I hired these extra, I was safety director for Development Corp. And so we hired extra police to patrol the uh, streets. Now, police and security forces are not the most highly educated people in the world. And most of them don't go to progressive churches. They don't have a Christian conditioning for social responsibility. They just have their jobs and, and um, they carry them out as best they can. But certainly if you're going to do the work of getting meals delivered, shelters established, you have to have protection. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that means using the type of police and type of security people that we can hire. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, I've done security organizing in the high rises myself, and I've had police at my meetings and I've taught police ethics. Uh, so I don't mean... To, to just hire them, <laughs> but to involve yourself in uh, security forces. I think John Calvin is a great realist. Mm -hmm. And he put, he put it this way, that if we believe 
our streets need to be made safe and we will patrol them. It behooves us to uh, guard the city walls as well. And of course, then he reached out in all sorts of diplomatic ways with the forces around him. And I think that's, to me, the connection is so clear that if we believe we need order in our cities, and that sometimes we have to resort to those who will use violence if they have to, and sometimes they'll misuse it, uh, we can do no less with protect, uh, protecting our, our borders. Um, so, you know, I'm blessed, uh, like very few people have been, in being in this activist church, which has run soup kitchens, uh, dormitories, the, the building and financing of houses in the neighborhood. Uh, we're traditionally president of the development corporation and heavily involved in the social service cooperative ministry. So <clears throat> for me, the Christian life here in Pittsburgh has been so thrilling because of what this uh, large integrated church uh, does with a social minister. Mm -hmm. And if I want to know what the black community is thinking, you know, I, do, I can talk to any members of my church. Uh, not any, but to many different ones who are very involved in the church and also involved in the in the neighborhood. So that's been a real blessing to my my soul. And I know, unfortunately, most professors don't get that sort of opportunity to find that sort of uh, Christian community, which mm -hmm. is engaged in doing all the work of uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. When you think of uh, the questions that come around uh, Christian realism today, especially ones that are shaped by the past presidential election and everything going on now, um, like how how do you think the Christian realists would help frame the debates that progressive Christians had throughout uh, the election process? Uh, because I know plenty that advocated, you know, not voting for Hillary or voting for Hillary and um, how the church should relate to questions around uh, religious liberty and freedom that came up through the process. And uh, and, and I feel like that we're at a place where a lot of Christians want their faith to have something to say about the the the, the power and the and the questions are shaping uh, society and culture in their lives. And yet the church in America today is less consciously connected and aware with the tradition to think with in it. And we end up uh, either, you know, dodging, taking the big questions uh, seriously as uh, uh, the church at large, or we take real, real basic, shallow answers that just locate us ideologically. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh... I would welcome, you know, dialogues or conversations with evangelical Christians or Anabaptists over any of these issues. And, of course, I've participated particularly with the Anabaptist the wing. My brother and I wrote a uh, piece for the Iowa newspapers, an op-ed piece, uh, portraying Hillary Clinton as the Methodist Sunday school teacher that she, in fact, was. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to reach the Methodists, and uh, particularly the Methodists, but also other concerned voters in, uh, in Iowa. And um, I knew her MYF counselor, a man by the name of Don Jones, who taught uh, religious ethics at Drew University. Mm -hmm. And uh, he... Uh, would read Hillary the same way as, uh, oh, it, he was present when I preached Niebuhr's funeral. And he said the same sorts of things that his students just loved Niebuhr and became activists because of what they learned uh, from Niebuhr. And I think that's the way to read Hillary mm -hmm. as a sort of Niebuhrian Methodist. And Obama, of course, was United Church of Christ until he had to leave because of uh, Reverend Wright. 
But uh, ne- uh, Obama regards Niebuhr as his leading philosopher. Mm-hmm. And if you look at if you look at his Nobel Peace Prize lecture, uh, Niebuhr could have written it. Yeah, I had people phone, I had people phone me and ask, Ron, did you write that speech? And of course, I had nothing to do with it at all. But there are so many strands of Niebuhr in Obama. So I was saying this last, uh, the previous election where you had McCain, Hillary, and Obama running, you had three Nieburians. Uh, running. That doesn't mean I love McCain's politics, mm-hmm. but he was he was steeped in him too. In this last race, there was only one Niburian. Um We don't know much about Trump's church attendance, but we know that he was a marble collegiate. Some of the time, while he was meeting his current wife and while Norman Vincent Peale was preaching. Mm-hmm. And I know Norman Vincent Peale personally, and he's a very insecure, he was a very insecure person. And I see uh, Trump as a very insecure person, but buying into the optimism and the bravado that uh, Norman Vincent Peale often showed, and but particularly the optimism. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he can't deliver on the uh, optimism and He's way in over his depth, and it's so it's sort of crazy uh, what's happening right now. But he was a winning TV personality to many, and a lot of people speak at the same level he speaks at, and so he's persuasive to that something less than 40%, and all you need then are the solid uh, evangelical voters uh, from the South who will vote uh, Republican. And so whoever gets the Republican nomination, by and large, gets their vote. Uh, Obama could transcend that in, what, two or three states? Mm. But normally a Democrat cannot, no matter how religious or how theological, can't to get past that uh, alt-right religious vote. So we're in a situation where... Most Christians aren't progressive, and uh, they're ready to fall for a strong man who will endorse uh, anti-abortion and uh, some other traditional uh, evangelical issues. Uh, On the religious liberty issue, um, though I have engaged in some court cases to... uh, protect the separation of church and state. Some One of them was a pretty famous issue. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I don't think religious liberty in America has been uh, threatened. Now, there are ethical decisions mm. that get made over, over issues of life and death and abortion and birth control and women's rights and things like those, <clears throat> but I, I would not regard, regard those primarily as uh, religious issues. You know, I can meet with my Catholic theologian friends, and we don't have a theological difference. We have a disagreement over uh, when life's potential and when it's potentially human and when it's really a human life and what the right, right relationship of the state is there. So I think a lot of the religious liberty issues had to do with um, ethical issues on which well-meaning Christians can disagree depending on their technology and the reading of the facts and their own personal persuasions and where they are in campaigns and so forth. Um, Now, the Presbyterian Church was opposing Trump on uh, getting rid of the Johnson Amendment. That's the one that indicates that if you endorse, if a non-profit endorses a candidate, uh, they may be subject to losing their tax exemption. Mm-hmm. And the Presbyterian Church wanted to hold with that. I don't know whether they wrote any letters or not, but I know they were discussing it in Louisville. For my own opinion, was that we might as well observe that in the Presbyterian Church, because we distinguish between our politics and our theology mm-hmm. and our religion and our politics. We don't make them 
radically dualist, but we certainly distinguish them. But some African-American churches don't, and the Catholic Church doesn't do it so, so sharply. And some churches, which re- really were separation, like the Baptist churches in the South, are, are no longer uh, separation. So I'm uh, willing to say the Presbyterian Church shouldn't try and impose its will <laughs> on this particular issue. But I would always counsel my uh, my students uh, not to be that directly involved. You know, you can preach on the moral issues of gun control. You can preach on and the moral issues. In fact, in our social teachings in the Presbyterian Church, uh, the preachers are urged to preach biblically out of the Presbyterian tradition uh, responsibly on the moral parts of the uh, a political discussion. And so it's not even you may, it's fact that they are urged to, but preaching on the moral aspects of a social debate is different than endorsing particular candidates. Mm-hmm. Now, I would always say in my classes, there may be times when you need to make an exception. You wouldn't want to be uh, a Christian in Germany not condemning Hitler. And there, if there gets to be such a time in the United States, uh, you better be true to your church and your Christian faith and take the risk at that point of leading uh, against it. But that that's a very, very exceptional case because there are so many checks and balances in the United States and we're protected by so many laws that it's hard to envisage that you would have to endorse a candidate. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I always leave open that exception, you know, general rule, you don't, but there are exceptions where you do. One of the things, and you mentioned it was uh, Obama's acceptance of the Nobel peace prize. And there were a couple lines in it that, that I thought of when you said, Oh, uh, you know, it sounds like Niebuhr could have wrote it because in it, he said that uh, he said, we must begin by acknowledging the hard truth we will not eradicate violent conflict in our lifetimes. There will be times right. when nations acting individually or in concert will find the use of force not only necessary but morally justified. And then yeah. uh, in a paragraph or so later he says, uh, to say that force may sometimes be necessary is not a call to cynicism. It is a recognition of history, the imperfections of man, and the limits of reason. Uh, I had a number of my divinity students read that in uh, Intro to Ethics uh, seminar. And the, those were the lines that made a number of them uncomfortable, but they also, it, you know, with a few questions, are like, yeah, but I don't know what else I would say either. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? So can, can you just, like, yeah. one of the things I think we have or aren't doing as well in an age where theological ethics is dominated by identity politics um and uh, and these kind of clarion calls for revolution, except it's all a bunch of people with health insurance and jobs. So, like, uh, who, who don't know how to use a gun? Yeah. So, can, can you describe like what it is, or what's the dignity of being that honest about the necessity of uh, of violence and the limits of reason, and not leading to cynicism? Well, that's all. That could have been Niebuhr uh, from beginning to end. He might have said it more eloquently. But <laughs> um, the you know, the usual conflict that states who might have a Christian statesman as a prime minister or president comes to is the violence is already happening. Mm-hmm. So it's... Um, what do you, what's going to be your response? It's not a question of is there going to be violence or not. The violence is is going on. Now in Crimea, uh, the violence went on, and the United States decided uh, any cost of intervention there would be way too great. It's it's almost over. <clears throat> We're going to uh, stay out. The United States. Uh, Clinton stayed out of Yugoslavia for a long, long time. 
And I really wasn't advocating U.S. intervention until uh, Dubrovnik was shelled mercilessly. So the violence is already going on. Now, in a season, the violence will stop, of course. But are, where are you going to be if you have this overwhelming power and don't use it? Uh, what does responsibility to end the conflict mean? And uh, obviously, you know, I taught courses on Gandhi and King and uh, so influenced by Martin Luther King Jr. that obviously uh, the Christian wants to utilize nonviolence mm -hmm. whenever it's possible and soft diplomacy all the time. And But there are times when... Uh, for the sake of peace, as Augustine said, you know, you're required to enforce the peace or to uh, defend those who are, cannot defend themselves. You know, <clears throat> when I supported coming back to my analogy with the police department in, in Pittsburgh, uh, when I taught police ethics and worked with them, and I heard their anger at the church because the church seemed to be too critical of the way the blues treated the blacks. But somehow, you have to maintain peace in a, in a violent world. Uh, you know, now if you want to speak about it, I don't follow this line of argument very often, but the cosmos is violent. Mm -hmm. You know, there are uh, clusters of stars and stars blowing up all around us. Uh, nature is... Uh, is violent. I have a, a pool with some beautiful fish in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Whenever the raccoons come around, I trap them <laughs> and take them take them to the park. You know, at that point, I'm entrapping animals that want to be wild, and I'm transporting them. But I'm doing. It's just. It's just the world is violent, and sometimes we have to intervene. Sometimes with violence hopefully the minimum violence mm -hmm. to uh, defend other forms of life. But biologically, life preys on life. Now, I've never been on a safari. My wife has, and she says she could never go again because all you see is that one animal devouring another, you know, and that's too violent for her to want to look at or at least for her to want to admit to being part of her recreation or something. So from a realist perspective, the world is violent. Mm -hmm. And are you going to uh, intervene sometimes to try and reduce that? I could maybe mention it this way. My son was PhD candidate at Harvard in international relations. And his professor is a famous Harvard government professor, Bob Cohane, Robert Cohane is his name. Great guy. But he would always say, now, realism is good in times of conflict. But he would say, I can't see how the realism of Morgenthau and Niebuhr or Augustine or others would take us very far in peacetime. Now, my response to my son <clears throat> when he says that to me is, that'll be fine. I'll wait for the peacetime. I have always lived my whole life in times of war preparation for war or the threat of war. I have not seen that peacetime that Bob Cohane is saying that uh, realism would not illumine very well. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's all within the context, Trip, of my you know, writing against military budgets, of my taking students to lobby uh, senators of... Uh, writing whenever I could to resist militarism. Um, so like in everything else, you have to try and find a way to do it with as little destruction as possible, little harm as possible, but still to stop the uh, attacker. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes, as they, someone would put it in, in World War II, sometimes slavery is worse than the fight, you know? And so you, you have to uh, have to join in the fight. I think Niebuhr and others were great in that they would continue to confess their sin. 
they knew it wasn't the best action. You know, there's a. Have you seen the new Niebuhr film? No, no. I've I've I heard uh, I've heard about it, but I haven't seen it yet. Okay, there's a scene in there where Stanley Hauer was the great guru of some of these Anabaptists. Uh, says that the debate between Reinhold and H. Richard Niebuhr in the 30s was over preparing for war or not preparing for war. Now, that's just false. Hauerwas's pacifism is often based on not being able to read very well. <laughs> what that debate... What, seriously, he doesn't read Wesley any better than he reads Niebuhr. But uh, the um, what that debate was about was because Japan was invading Manchuria, whether the United States should continue to send its oil and its steel to Japan, or whether it should boycott Japan, <clears throat> I put a sanction on, so they could not have that, that steel and that oil. It was to stop the violence that was already underway. And that's when H. Richard Niebuhr wrote that famous essay, The Grace of Doing Nothing. Mm-hmm. And Reinhold responded, must we do nothing? And so that was the only time they really debated in public. But it wasn't a question of going to war or not going to war. It was a question of are we going to try and stop Japan from its imperial wars that is expanding through the Chinese population with all the atrocities it's bringing. Mm-hmm. And that's the point I want to make, that often uh, it's not voting to start the violence. The violence is already going on. It's what your role going to be. Um, and the Presbyterian Church has taken the position that humanitarian intervention for the sake of saving populations is often a Christian responsibility. Now, they don't say always. And they say you have to use the just war criteria. You have to be looking for peace. You have to use other methods, too. But they recognize that... Uh, at times, you do have to use force, which I guess all mainline churches do, but I don't know that they have that explicit policy, you know, on humanitarian intervention, like the Presbyterian Church worked mm-hmm. out. Well, well, I represented that peti- petition one, that position once in Geneva, and there were Russians there, and they they couldn't stand me talking about the need for saving populations. But I had a Muslim representative from Kosovo sitting next to me, a woman who hoped she might be foreign minister in the new government when Kosovo got established. And she had had to leave her city under Serbian attack. And she said to me, Ron, you Americans are our saviors. Now, to me, that's pretty heavy language Mm -hmm. (laughs) to say you're a savior. But some of the people who don't want the responsible use of power should have that experience of someone feeling that American power has saved them. Yeah, I think I I I think the like where that comes from or the hesitation or the uncomfortability comes from those who uh, think. Whether, like, would we be better off as a globe if if America wasn't playing the role it plays? Like some people, the indispensable nation, and, and that kind of thing. And and I wonder what, um, how do you see that today? And maybe what are the questions that, if we acknowledge the position America's in globally, uh, maybe should disturb us as engaged citizens? Like, what are the questions that should disturb us so we try to live faithfully in? Um, acknowledging the reality of the role we play in the globe. Yeah, I've uh, argued that uh, we shouldn't be patrolling the Mediterranean Sea or the Indian Ocean. That we don't need to militarily, and it overextends us. It's uh, based partially in pride and some of those, some of that same rhetoric you mentioned about the indispensable. Uh, nation uh, from a geopolitical point of view if we're secure in uh, the Atlantic and secure in uh, Pacific uh, 
we can take care of the rest of the stuff without having all those bases out there mm -hmm. that we have. It's a scandal to have 150 or 60 foreign bases and to have all the spies working that we do and sending you know, this being the, the manufacturer and, and the purveyor of more weapons than anybody else does. That's neither good policy nor can it be reconciled with uh, Christian ethics. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, just a little bit of the history, uh, Clergy and Laity Concerned was pretty much a realist organization. It was founded in John Bennett's living room, and Niebuhr was on the executive committee. And that was the most powerful religious voice against the war in Vietnam. And uh, <clears throat> any of us are co cooperating with it knew it. And most powerful and had the biggest budget and had the most meetings. And, uh, you know, the, John Bennett got put on the president's enemy list <clears throat> because of his opposition to the war in Vietnam. And Morgenthau and Niebuhr were among the earliest critics. And then they were the most effective critics of the war in Vietnam. So uh, the imperial overreach is is not a, a, re a realist political scientist and others have participated in it. No doubt about, about that. And so are people from other political persuasions, but it needs to be attacked and driven back. Um, I think armed intervention to capture bin Laden and to have concentrated on doing that was in order. And if the government of Afghanistan failed in the process, uh, that's that's a tough break. You know, that's just the way the world tumbles. But the invasion of Iraq was immoral, unwise, illegal, and we're, we're still pursuing it. So if I were anywhere near policymakers, I'd be advocating ways to back out mm -hmm. with as much responsibility as we could muster. But I would have been more radical than Obama in, um, in backing out. But mm -hmm. of course, the realist perspective would have wanted a whole lot more religious consideration going before you ever went into such a quagmire. And you would have seen that if you toppled uh, this uh, particular form of government you have in Iraq, you're likely to have a Shiite influence increasing and it will persecute and so forth. So there's been this total lack of religious understanding of what Americans are doing in foreign policy. Mm -hmm. I got into the anti-Vietnam movement in 63, uh, particularly over the immolation of the Buddhist monks and Madame Nu. Um, saying uh, so much for the Petite Predicateurs. So I founded a little group named the Petite Predicateurs, and we met Madame New at the airport and tried to prevent her from getting off the tarmac. But we didn't have enough student support, even from Union. <laughs> Police just brushed us out of the way. But the Christian realism was dead set against Vietnam, and I think they needed, and the, well, the Presbyterian Church again, under some of our leadership, was a mixture of realist and pacifist leadership in the Presbyterian Church that got the church to declare it was immoral, illegal, and unwise to invade Iraq. So American imperial responsibility has to be reduced, but it doesn't make any sense if you're American just to polemicize against American empire because we are a continental empire and we defeat, you know, we either chase the Spanish and the English and the French and the Russians and the Mexicans out of the area that we live in, as well as destroying the Native American tribes. So by every traditional definition, the United States of America is an empire, even if it weren't abroad. Mm -hmm. So you need a more sophisticated critique, I think, than just to critique the American empire, particularly if you assume that there are not other empires in the world. Mm -hmm. China has always been an, China's always been an empire. It's part of their self understanding. So so for the Russians. Uh the people in native people in Siberia <laughs> didn't speak Russian. Uh, even Brazil in periods of its history has called itself an empire. So the rhetorical left and it's 
use of empire as a word of critique, though it's understandable. Uh, and I think is misbegotten. Both Russia and the United States claimed they were not empires, but in fact, both were. So the invasion of Iraq was was uh, the neoconservative invasion, you know, which is still a political option in political philosophy. Uh-huh. And uh, as I said, I think Af- Afghan one, as long as you're going after bin Laden, particularly given that Afghanistan was still in civil war when they went in, I think that one could be, not the way it's come out, but if you kept your intentions clear, it might have been a justifiable intervention. Mm-hmm. So how does the shift from uh, more power existing in nation states where democracies have influence and power, like you can uh, regulate things, redistribute wealth, you can um, assert and protect rights, as, as we move into seeing the market – uh, have more power than than governments and, and nation states and dealing with crises like the environmental crisis or, and, or uh, um, things like that where borders don't uh, play the role they used to. What, what does it look right. like to think as a Christian realist seeing the way the power relations between religion, state, and economy are shifting? Well, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, the um, economy is probably less subject to Christian social ethics than our politics, even. Uh, I had assigned a page from Niebuhr's diary, 1928, where he says, you know, that American economics is hardly influenced by Christian ethics at all. And I handed it out to my class and this is a, a continuing education at class at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, the people I ate it up. I said, you know, this is one lady who spoke said, this is sort of a new insight for me. I come at this class because I'm a religious person. And, but to realize that he's saying the economy doesn't have any ethical restraints upon it way back in the 1920s. She says, that's new information for me. And I see things differently now. Um, yeah, we're, the regulations are going to become less, the corporate powers are being given the government, um, and it's a, it's really a sad time. I think still the fundamental question is controlling nuclear weapons so we don't destroy the whole thing. I mean, no Christian should be comfortable with the present uh, proliferation and presence of these arsenals that the Soviet Union and the United States contains. Because we know these arsenals are targeted on the children of the other party. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're city busters. And this is as immoral as you can get to think about uh, killing those Russian children or here in Pittsburgh where we, we don't have so much atomic power now as we did then. We used to fuel the aircraft carriers and design the new nuclear weapons right here in Westinghouse and Rockwell International's headquarters here at the time. Gulf Oil and Alcoa controlled the price of uh, uranium. Uh, those days for Pittsburgh are, are past, but uh, that's a horrendous situation which needs to be addressed much more in Christian ethics. Mm-hmm. Okay, well... You know, the churches have developed policy uh, vis-a-vis economy and trying to regulate globalization, pushing for labor standards and ecological standards. But the churches vis-a-vis these institutions are so, so weak. The numbers of employees of these corporations, like Ford, was 211,000. Compare that to the professional resources of any of our Christian churches except the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church doesn't work very hard on economics. You know, for the churches to see even support a major study on economic justice, 
is a relatively rare thing. Now, mm-hmm. some of them can still fund those sorts of studies and get the materials out there. Some of the churches still divest from corporations when they go too far on weapons or on ecological standards. But I think you're right that at the point of ecology and the point of economics, we're going to have to hope for Christian lay people becoming public theologians Mm -hmm. on these issues. Now, I think Larry Rasmussen's writing on ecological ethics is first rate. And he, of course, operates out of that old Union Christian Realist standard. Bob Stiver's writing on ecology is great. Uh, James Martin and Gloria, not Gloria, what's that? Laura Stiver's case study book on ecological ethics is a fine piece. So there are little pieces here, mm-hmm. but uh, the church is being... Uh, swamped by the power of the secular think tanks. The the foundations are able to do much more on these issues. But, you know, when I started writing on ecology, I haven't done much writing on ecology, but I did write a piece in 72 on limits to growth. And Larry Rasmussen started writing ecological ethics just a few years later. And Roger Shin started before I did. And so there's a group of people that have been writing, but now it's become a secular issue. So the church voice is still present in the ecological debate, but it's become a much broader public issue, and the church contributions uh, don't look that significant anymore. And this is particularly true for mainline churches where resources have drawn up, Mm -hmm. where... You know, 20 years ago, the Presbyterian Church could have mount a major study and have major world thinkers in to participate in it. But the church just doesn't have those resources anymore. So I think we need to keep sharpening the consciences of our ministers. I've seen, I've done some doctor of ministry teaching before I retired, Mm -hmm. and I found pastors who were not too interested in social ethics we're running into ecological ethics issues in their churches, and we're beginning to deal with them. Oh, Trepp, I wanted to ask you, what seminary do you teach in? So um, I just finished my Ph.D. at Claremont, and I teach at the Hatchery, which is a, it's a new alternative-type seminary. So students come in and do a master's in theological education and one in social entrepreneurship, and they're coming in with the goal of starting – um, alternative communities around uh, service, an activist community, nonprofit, or uh, business around a cause, like you know, job training out of prison and that kind of thing. But well, that sounds great. I'm glad to hear about it. I was, I knew I needed to ask when you mentioned you had a lot of Anabaptist students who were resistant to the responsibilities of power. In in and from the that, podcast, that's when I w- thought I want, wanted to ask you. But it sounds like a great place to work. If we'll, because of the podcast, each month I'll get sixty to 70,000 people download an episode, and I try to interview as broad a sample of of uh, thoughtful theologians that exist. So I, people will listen regularly but are more attached to different you know uh, parts of the conversation. And um, the the people who I think should gladly wield the Christian realist title – uh, the younger younger professors and, and such uh, they still have an uneasiness with it that uh, they, they act Niborian and but they sound like a, a liberation theologian or uh, when you were bringing up the questions around empire and stuff like that um, that uh, yeah I think that the 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 way we think theologically and the resources and things that attract people are often come from different contexts, like liberation theologies come from different places or um, you, you love the kind of hard sayings of Jesus and like, I want to live this out. And then you, you, you don't acknowledge the way in which you're having to negotiate it that a Christian realist framework puts on front street. Like, uh, you know, just the difference between the, what is ethically possible 
as a society and you as an individual needs to be acknowledged. And then there's a type of responsibility that's demanded the easy, uh, easy answers or even ones you, that, you know, are, are beautiful enough to be true at the eschaton uh, don't work. Uh, so you have to dig in. My local inner city Presbyterian church has on its headboard progressive, inclusive, and I've forgotten what the third word is, but there's that use of progressive on a mainline uh, church. And I would have always thought Niebuhr, you know, as a founder of Americans for Democratic Action, or Tillich as a founder of CARE and uh, Im- Immigrant Relief uh, and their commitment to the welfare of the state organization would have always been regarded as progressive. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how one would take the title of progressive away from Christian realism. As I've always understood it, as to be concerned about justice for the city and the local situation, as well as the uh, national. I I grew up in North Carolina, and I went to Divinity School at Wake Forest University. So, oh yeah, and John Nor- Seavers there now. Yeah, in in North Carolina, like half the mainline ministers are Howard Wassians because they all went to Duke. Yeah, and. Uh, they, uh, yeah, I, I don't like Duke basketball. So, you know, it was, <laughs> I just was never tempted, uh, to go there. But, um, I do think there's a, uh, among like evangelicals that are opening, like progressive evangelicals and, uh, the Howard Wassian type within mainline, there's a, from that side, there's this consistent, like, new form of kind of Catholic anabaptism that comes up. Yeah, and and then there's the uh, the the younger ministers that have a kind of Occupy Wall Street. We can let it burn down, Bernie or bust, uh, in uh, super aggressive around identity politic issues. Uh, that kind of um, reactionary progressivism. It exists and Niebuhr's uh, it's like Niebuhr's not hot headedly energetic enough. Um, Who's doing the moral Monday Would these people you're speaking about be doing the moral Monday? No, I well, I'm, I'm friends with uh, Reverend Dr. Barber. Who's kind of the organizer of it. He works extremely hard at making it a, a very diverse group. I mean, you have a, a mix of people from, like I know professors at all the seminaries in North Carolina that participate in Moral Monday movement. Yeah, uh, and- I know there are some from Columbia Seminary that do. Mm-hmm. And so I, I thought it was quite open to the main line. But you're you're speaking of uh, a sort of Catholic Anabaptist, which always seems just like a complete contradiction to me. You're you're seeing these people being much more important in North Carolina now. Well, it, like I have I have friends that. Um, you know, they get to a church, and their their primary goal is to get a flag out of the sanctuary, and um, that and the the kind of Howard Wassian Lindbeck stuff, where the the like I have friends that are Baptists that go there, and they're wanting to use creeds and stuff in a Baptist church because this is you know the language of 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 Christianity and things. I'm like, uh, you know. I'm I'm pretty sure that's not what Baptists were looking for, um, and so. But I I think a lot of it is it, it, not the, Roger Williams anyway. Yeah, but you know, a lot of it is this in a kind of post Christendom coming of age for millennials and younger. Where is it that the distinctiveness of your Christian identity is held to act, and um. And so a, a more intense, like be it around the language game or this we're resident aliens or, you know, we're, we're the real, real progressives who are most, you know, like forward on it and things. I, I, I think that 
that the energy in those groups it comes from not having a pl- way to locate yourself in the church with confidence. And, and so you need to like turn the dial up on something to go like, this really matters. And, um, the, the renewal of interest in Niebuhr st- stuff has been exciting to me just cause I've always, I've always appreciated him. And but my dad was a church historian who, um, never answered questions and made me read books if I asked them. So oh, lucky you. So, so he, he was like, the, be, the best, best theologians come out of the, uh, parish, I think, and out of that sort of coaching. Yeah. I just, I, I, when I've heard about the documentary about Niebuhr, I thought, Oh, this is good because more attention is being given. And I, I just know how, you and you made the joke about Hauerwas's pacifism uh, uh, being based on his inability to read well. Um, I just, I finally read his Guilford lectures and I started it. And after the Niebuhr chapter, I quit because I was like, "What is he talking about? The the grain against the universe." That's a terrible chapter. Yeah, and I. Uh, but at the end, he celebrates the Pope and uh, the labor Catholic uh, woman. And, uh, and an Anabaptist, if I recall rightly. And they weren't discussed particularly in the book, but, uh, oh, and John Yoder. Mm-hmm. And the conclusion just doesn't hang together. I mean, one, maybe one, one way to, to, to have like a nice, uh, end, it would be, uh, we, we discussed a lot of stuff that came out of, uh, of your career and, and things that are connected to the present. And we didn't get around to, you telling stories about your relationship with uh, Niebuhr and Tillich and this type of stuff. So, like, if you're thinking of um, your favorite story to tell uh, about uh, about Reinhold, uh, which is what's the story you tell where where you're hoping to communicate what it was like to to you know have him as a mentor and a friend? Well, the um, just a concluding work about Reiny. I. Uh, of course, didn't know him in his strength. The person I knew was an old man who was crippled uh, from his strokes. Mm-hmm. And so I knew him in the 60s, and he'd been crippled for eight or nine years before I ever heard him. And he'd been crippled about 12 before I began to work with him and for him. But he was incredibly generous and full of good humor and uh, liked to laugh and, uh, a trusted friend that would, uh, go out and make life, uh, easy or easier for his, uh, friends. I, I can only remember one story he told and he blamed it on, uh, Whiston Auden. Uh, Whiston had told him, uh, about the good person who had good saintly woman, like one of the women that Niebuhr describes and leaves a notebook in a tame cynic who died and went to heaven and got there and immediately wanted to see uh, Mary and fell at the feet of Mary and just proclaimed how blessed she was to have this opportunity to meet Mary and how Mary had done so much for the world and how uh, her giving birth and raising her blessed son had had saved this woman from travail and uh, sin. And Mary's response was, well, that's, that's right. And I'm thankful too, but I really wanted a daughter. <laughs> and I, I remember when neighbor told me that story on Riverside drive where uh, he needed an escort. You know, he couldn't put up with a urban situation in his crippled this and he, his left side was pretty badly crippled. So he walked slowly, but he walked with purpose, and he w- never gave up on any social issue. Mm-hmm. He was always trying to calculate what we could do to make the world a little more just, or how we could use the power that seemed to be against us, how that could be turned uh, to work for the good. The classic story about him and Tillich, which everyone has a different version of. And I've printed one or two versions, I think, in the books I've written. But uh, Niebuhr always suspected that Tillich's thought 
ran uh, to romantic naturalism and drifted even pretty close to pantheism. And he said as much in one of his classes. And unusually, neither uh, union professors didn't criticize each other. But on hearing that story running around the halls, uh, Tilly heard it and uh, put it away. And so another day when they were walking on Riverside Drive, this would be before I got there, of course, uh, Tillich stopped to admire the trees. And Riney would never notice a tree. And he'd walked on ahead. And then finally Niebuhr realized that he was talking and no one was listening. So he turned around and saw Tillich standing back there, sort of gazing into the forest. And he said, Paulus, Paulus, uh, what are you doing? And Paulus uh, responded, uh, well, the damn nature pantheist is worshiping the trees. <laughs> so that was a classic story that went around Union about the uh, two of them. Uh, the great thing about studying both Niebuhr and Tillich is that they are so conscious of their her- theological and social political heritages. So they have worked through Hegel and Marx, not to speak of Aristotle and Plato, and so when you're dealing with them, you're not dealing just with their current fashion of ideas. You're dealing with the whole history of Christian thought, revelation, and understanding. And often people don't know that. They know it about Tillich, but they don't appreciate it enough in Niebuhr. And that's because they haven't read his book reviews or sat in his classes. So they'll see a casual comment dismissing somebody <laughs> you know, in one of his books. And it maybe throws away Hegel or dismisses Marx easily. But because they haven't read the book reviews or heard his lectures on these subjects, they don't know how much depth is behind it. Well, after I came back from Oxford, I was sitting in his seminar, and he was going on with his classical critique of uh, Plato. And I hesitatedly raised a hand and said, I'd I didn't think that was accurate, and I thought it was more like this, and wouldn't that make Plato stronger? And uh, Niebuhr just sort of winked at the rest of the class, and he quoted in Greek two or three sentences from the Republic and asked me to comment. (laughs) At that point, he had me, you know, Mm -hmm. because I certainly could not translate his Greek enough to know what he was saying, and uh, so the class went on. Um, I know... uh, Another time, a class of young men were hanging up the progress of the class, of the seminar, uh, wanting to argue with him on sexual ethics. And he sounded much more dogmatic and less pragmatic on social ethics than he usually was. And uh, then as we walked on Riverside Drive following that, he said, Ron, the seminar has to move on. we got a lot of other subjects we have to cover, and we can't keep spinning our wheels on uh, sexual ethics. And uh, I, of course, agreed. It was his seminar. I was just the assistant. But then he went on to say, you know, and part of the problem is we got all these young men in here who are all hot-blooded. Now, here I am, this old crippled man with a very beautiful but younger wife. So we just got to stop this conversation. But then later, I chided Mrs. Niebuhr or Ursula when she brought in refreshments after the seminar. And her husband sounded dogmatic on uh, sexual ethics. And she said, oh, that's right, Ron. You know, marriage is such a happy institution. We're both doing everything we can to protect it. And that was his basic argument. Other arguments came up. But really the traditional Protestant sexual ethic that he was uh, defending was uh, based on... uh, fidelity and nurturing the relationships within the family and that was really what his argument was Mm -hmm. so uh, Tillich was deeper on some subjects probably had a deeper understanding of Marx than Niebuhr did and Tillich had been an activist and he still was in founding organizations and so forth uh, in this uh, country but not, not as much as Niebuhr and when Tillich started really writing a systematic theology. His uh, political activity went down, and uh, he had this other vocation. Uh, someone said, I think it was Wilhelm Pauk, just said, well, uh, something to the effect that 
Tillich isn't doing as much politics anymore because God wants him to write a systematic theology. <laughs> so we had a good time. Oh, one other joke, which might be useful, is just the one, one public fight that Niebuhr and Tillich had. They had other questions about epistemology. But Tillich said that uh, Picasso's Guernica, you may have heard this, was the most Protestant painting of the 20th century. And Niebuhr wrote something that he didn't think was particularly Protestant. There was nothing much affirmed there. And Picasso himself wasn't a Protestant. He didn't understand it as a Protestant painting. So then uh, Tillich came back and <clears throat> defended his judgment. Then in personal conversation, uh, Niebuhr said to Tillich, well, you know, I shouldn't have uh, really commented on that in, in public because in art, I'm just a moron. And then they, they went their separate ways. The story is that Tillich spent a couple, three weeks trying to figure out what school of art m moron was. <laughs> and his English was his English wasn't a, a, enough until he finally, uh, before he phoned the Museum of Modern Art, you know, which he had dedicated the new wing to, uh, to find out what was going on. His, uh, his daughter uh, told him uh, what the English meaning of the word moron was. <laughs> cleared up the problem. <laughs> so uh, there are lots of other stories to go on, but those are the ones that I remembered and can speak a little bit to the authenticity of.